in the sanctuary, and to those watching virtually. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the South Georgia Shore. Thank you for joining us, we who bring a teaching of hope, who bring a saving message, we who welcome all in our doors, the joyful, the heartbroken, atheists and Christians, Muslims and Jews, straight and gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, transgender, all who are searching, seeking, looking for more, more meaning, more service, more love. All of us gathered here today. My name is Nick Bonar, and I am your worship associate this morning. I am a member of this congregation and currently serve on the membership committee and as a leader and as a worship associate. Our worship service today is led by Deb Dabirini. Deb has been a member of UUCSJS since 2006. Her last professional position before retirement was assistant provost and adjunct professor at Stockton University. Deb has also served as a consultant for several accreditation agencies, colleges, and businesses. She has published two books on Facebook and several articles on subjects ranging from learning assessment to accreditation to baseball. She holds a doctorate in education from Rutgers, designs and constructs jewelry, and roots for the mess and the Phillies. And the Yankees, when they're not playing the mess. <laughs> she is present, presently the worship coordinator at UUCSJF. Video of today's service will be available on YouTube channel later today. If you care to tweet during today's service, you can use the hashtag UUCSJS. To those gathered live on Facebook, we welcome your comments, as well as your joys and sorrows on that platform. Please remember that this video will be on the internet, so do not share information best kept private. Welcome to worship. <laughs> Oh, 
I just wanna be okay, be okay, be okay. I just wanna be okay today. I just wanna be okay, be okay, be okay. I just wanna be okay today. I just wanna feel today, feel today, feel today. I just wanna feel something today. I just wanna know today, know today, know today, know that maybe I will be okay. Know that maybe I will be okay. Know that maybe I will be
touch on our week. During the musical interlude, you may come forward and place pebbles in the water to acknowledge your personal joy or sorrow. Amen. Mm-hmm. 
Hear from our speaker, Debbie. See, I'm not one of these people who's worried about everything. You got people like this around you. <laughs> Sorry. Figure <laughs> this out. Hi, I'm not going to be as entertaining, obviously. <laughs> I'll do my best. I'm an ardent member of the Church of Baseball. I grew up in a suburb outside of New York City, a normal, ordinary girl, 
doing well in school, playing with my Barbies, joining the Girl Scouts, and watching plenty of TV. I also played catch with my dad and my best friend, and either her dad, either her dad or my dad, um, many nights in the summer. My younger brother and sister and I played baseball with the neighborhood kids in our backyard. The weeping willow tree was first base. My brother's red jacket was second base. The spruce tree was third base. And the monkey bars were home plate. When I got a little older, I went to Yankee Stadium and Shea Stadium. I had always enjoyed baseball. But it wasn't until my mid-twenties that I became a true believer in the Church of Baseball. One of my mentors in graduate school knew that I liked baseball, so he gave me a copy of The Glory of Their Times, the one on the end, uh, one of the best baseball books ever published. Um, it, by the way, that's not the actual copy he gave me, but it's another copy of it. It's a collection of reminiscences of early 20th century ball players, researched and tape recorded by the late Lawrence Ritter, a former economics professor from NYU. Ritter traveled around the country and interviewed these former ball players in their homes about their baseball careers. Each chapter was in the words of that particular ball player telling stories of his teammates and his own career. Reading the book transported me to the very early 1900s, when people who couldn't get to the ballpark followed their favorite teams through late afternoon and evening newspapers. There was no TV, not even radio back then. I fell in love with the ball players' stories. I joined the Society for American Baseball Research, SABRE. I went to my first national SABRE convention, which was in Baltimore that year. And as one of the few women in the organization at that time, I was an outlier. A member of the press who was covering the convention interviewed me for an article in the Washington Post. It was a heady time for me. I met the son of one of the ball players in the glory of their times, Smokey Joe Wood, a talented young pitcher who came up with the Boston Red Sox in 1908. I met Smokey Joe's son at that first Sabre convention and arranged to interview the old ball player at his home in Connecticut. Smokey Joe and I became friends as much as a 93-year-old man and a 28-year-old woman could be friends. I visited Smokey Joe several times at his home in New Haven and was treated to demonstrations of his wind-up motion and his comments on current players and plays as we watched Red Sox games together. Imagine hanging out with a real major league ball player, watching games and chatting about various plays. I wrote my dissertation on how baseball stories for children from 1880 to 1950 socialized kids into positive behaviors. I even published two books and several articles about baseball. I was and still am completely hooked on the game of baseball. Much of George Carlin's brilliant characterization comparing baseball with football hints at why I love baseball so much. In the heartwarming novel, Shoeless Joe, by W.P. Kinsella, which the movie Field of Dreams was based on, the main character says that a ballpark at night is more like church than a church. Hall of Fame umpire Bill Clem said, baseball is more than a game to me, it's a religion. He's from way ago, early 20th century. And that's how I feel too. As you know, we have members of this UU congregation who are also Buddhists, pagans, atheists, Christians, and Jews. 
I am one of those you use who is also a worshiper in the church of baseball. <laughs> Like any other religion, baseball is rich in tradition, ritual, superstition, myth, myth, and the sacred. What's more sacred to a baseball fan than a revered player's record, such as, such as Babe Ruth's season home run record? When Roger Maris broke Babe, the Babe's season home run record in 1961, he was shunned. And when Hank Aaron broke Babe Ruth's career home run record of seven, uh, well, forget about the numbers, but the baseball world was hit with a tsunami of racism mixed with awe. A black man broke a white man's record. And that career home record, run record of Hank Aaron's would later be broken by Barry Bonds, but that's, that his record is tainted by steroids. Another record I believed would never be broken was the great Lou Gehrig's record of consecutive games played. But lo and behold, Cal, Cal Ripken broke that record in 1995. Um, when I was preparing this, I found an article I wrote in the late 1980s in which I stated that Gehrig's record would probably never be broken. Wrong. <laughs> One record I still believe will never be broken is Joe DiMaggio's hitting streak in 1941 with 56 consecutive games of hits. But who really knows? <laughs> One day about 40 years ago, I turned on the TV looking for a game to watch. The only one I could find was a Texas game. I've always hated Texas, especially now, with its medieval gun, uh, governor, gun control uh, legislation, lack of guns, um, and anti-abortion fervor. But it was baseball, and Nolan Ryan, the former Mets star, was pitching. So I watched. And as the game unfolded, I realized that I was witnessing history. Nolan Ryan was pitching his seventh no-hitter, a major league record. No one else has done that. And as a devout believer in the Church of Baseball, I prayed with each pitch for the no-hitter. <laughs> Even for a team I strongly disliked, I prayed for Nolan Ryan to achieve what no other pitcher in the majors has ever achieved a seventh no-hitter. And even though I watched it on TV, I witnessed history being made. Like any intrepid devotee of baseball, I went to a game at Yankee Stadium on August 4th, 1985, to witness more history being made, more meaningful baseball history to me. The great Tom Seaver, the former Mets pitcher, who was then pitching for the Chicago White Sox, had 299 wins when he was scheduled to pitch that day in the Bronx. The Yanks ballpark was packed with throngs of Mets fans. There were more Mets fans there than Yankee fans. Um, the magnificent Tom Seaver won the game, achieving what only 24 other pitchers in a century and a half of Major League Baseball history have managed to accomplish to win at least 300 games. Like most religions, the Church of Baseball has its share of superstition, too. For example, you don't talk about a no-hitter while it's in, pro in progress. Other players on the bench will stay away from the pitcher, giving him space. Superstition is the same reason, is a reason some players eat the same meal before every game or wear the same article of clothing. I remember me reading about a player in the 70s, I forget who now, he was on a hitting streak and he wore the same exact pair of socks every day without laundering them. Even his teammates commented on the smell. Speaking of superstitions, there are many well-known jinxes, 
such as the sophomore jinx, in which a star rookie doesn't play so well in his second year. But probably the biggest jinx of them all is the curse of the Bambino. This refers to the hugely consequential deal made in 1920 by the owner of the Boston Red Sox at the time. Now, Babe Ruth was an outstanding pitcher on the Red Sox. I mean, we know him as a great home runner, but he was an outstanding pitcher back then. His hitting prowess was, was not, it wasn't fully real. The hapless Red Sox owner needed cash because he also had Broadway productions to finance. So he sold Babe Ruth, the Bambino, to the New York Yankees. After that, the Yankees became a powerhouse team, and the previously top-notch Red Sox went for decades without a world championship. Finally, in 2004, after 84 years, the Red Sox won the World Series, interestingly, by beating the Yankees, and ended the curse of the Bambino. <laughs> As an aside, one of the stories that Smokey Joe Wood told me was about Babe Ruth. And Smokey Joe overlapped with Babe Ruth for two seasons, 1914 and 1915. Whether it was true or not, he told me that when they traveled to other cities, he would often room with Babe Ruth. Smokey Joe joked that he actually only roomed with the Babe's valises. One thing that was definitely true is what Smokey Joe said about his friend, the Babe. He said, he was just a great, big, good-natured kid. kid. And that's a direct quote. <laughs> Curse of the Bambino, sophomore jinx, in addition to superstitions, both religions and baseball have their rituals. Some Christians take communion, and baseball players have their own rituals. Each baseball player has a unique ritualized walk to the plate, home run stop, stride, and fielding style, especially a ritualized batting stance. What do some of these rituals that baseball and religion both have look like? Many batters cross themselves. Uh, before each pitch of the ball, and some of those who get a hit will say a quick prayer of thanks to God. I pointed one of those out to Nick the other day. To me, that's interdenominationalism at its very best. And the fan rituals, when you see, hear a chant of what sounds like booing for one of your own team's players, Fans chanting for a Lou or a Mookie or an Albert Poo Halls. And if your pitcher has two strikes on the batter, you, cl cl you clap rhythmically before the next pitch to get the strike out. <laughs> and one of the most cherished rituals of all is the seventh inning stretch. Democratic in that each player gets a turn at bat. 
excuse me, the batting order is sacrosanct. Unlike many team sports, virtually anyone can play it, and even the best players can and do strike out. Most religions also profess a keen sense of morality, just as does baseball. But both religion and baseball can be equally corrupt. We've learned about Catholic priests. In professional baseball, eight Chicago White Sox players were banned from baseball for life for throwing the 1919 World Series. Another example is Pete Rose, who's banned from baseball for gambling and lying about it. And like Shoeless Joe Jackson, he's not eligible for the Hall of Fame. Players of high moral character are revered, like Cal Ripken, and two of my personal favorites, Tom Seaver and Christy Matthewson. Now, you already know about Tom Seaver, who was elected to the Hall of Fame upon his first eligibility. That's kind of rare for somebody to come up to get voted in um, upon the first year that he's eligible. Um, but Christy Matthewson was an early 20th century pitcher who came up with the New York Giants in 1900. And he, he was elected to the Hall of Fame posthumously in its inaugural class in 1936. He died young because of exposure to poisonous gases fighting the world, First World War in Europe. He also accomplished, accomplished a singular feat in the 1905 World Series by winning, I think if you know baseball, you'll be amazed at this. Um, he won three complete game shutouts in less than a week. <laughs> Can you imagine that today? Pitchers don't even, they don't even start three games in a week. Early in the 20th century, every team, every town had its own baseball. During World War II, when Americans were losing sons, husbands, and brothers overseas, President Franklin D. Roosevelt, in what is now referred to as the Green Light Letter, wrote to then baseball commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis, saying that baseball should continue for the sake of the country's morale. That's right, baseball was critically important to the war effort by providing comfort for those at home. After the horrific shooting in Uvalde, Texas this past May, the town was about to cancel their planned hosting of a regional Little League tournament. Some of the students who played on that team were killed. But after discussions among the town leaders, parents, players, and the whole community, they all agreed that baseball was exactly what the town needed to begin healing. So they went ahead with the Little League tournament. Ron Shelton, writer and director of the hit baseball film Bull Durham, was catapulted to fame and fortune after making the popular movie in 1988. He recently published a book titled The Church of Baseball which discusses Shelton's years playing minor league baseball and the making of Bull Durham. Not only did a film about baseball make a splash for Ron Shelton, but it also revised, revitalized the city of Durham, North Carolina. In, three, in the three decades since the film came out, the population of Durham more than doubled and local businesses thrived. So why is baseball such a popular and healing activity, an all-American sport? Various people have written about it. Enlightened conservative George Will wrote, baseball, it is said, is only a game. True, and the Grand Canyon is only a hole in Arizona. <laughs> I love that quote. One of our Unitarian predecessors, the great poet, thinker, and writer, Walt Whitman, said about baseball, it's our game. That's the chief fact in connection with it. America's game has the snap, low, go fling of the American atmosphere, belongs as much to our institutions 
fits into them as significantly as our Constitution. Jacques Barzon, the French cultural historian, said, whoever wants to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball, the rules and realities of the game, and do it by watching first some high school or small town team. And if you saw the movie Bull Durham, you might remember Annie Savoy saying, I believe in the church of baseball. I tried all the major religions and most of the minor ones. I worship Buddha, Allah, Brahma, Vishnu, mushrooms, and Isadora Duncan. <laughs> I know things. For instance, there are 108 beads in a Catholic rosary, and there are 108 stitches in a baseball. When I heard that, I gave Jesus a chance. But it just didn't work out between us. The Lord laid too much guilt on me. I prefer metaphysics to theology. You see, there is no guilt in baseball. And it's never boring. I've tried them all, I really have. And the only church that truly feeds the soul, day in, day out, is the church of baseball. Thank you. Please rise now and bow your spirit and join us in singing our closing hymn 131 Love Will Guide Us. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Deb. <laughs>
A special thank you to Colby Tippins for taking care of the child's table and joys and concerns, Brussels, to those who have been bringing the, in the beautiful flowers this week. Join us next Sunday for You Can Teach an Old Dog New Tricks by Laura Kushner. A story of accepting child changes and finding out you may not be who you thought you were. Laura Kushner is a longtime member of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. She is currently attending Drew Theological School, where she is working towards her Masters of Divinity, and is the Minister of Intern for the UUA Faith Action New Jersey. Aside from her work with the Unitarian Universalism, she has taught preschool for the past 30 years. We warmly welcome all of you visiting us today. Please stay after and enjoy some light refreshments and coffee. Parents are encouraged to stay for the final moment of worship and to retrieve their children from downstairs after the bell has sounded. Now let us share a moment of silent reflection to consider today's message and the meaning it has in our lives.